Good morning, church, and happy Father's Day. My name is Amanda, and I'm a rising senior at Pepperdine University. And I am Ruet. I'm currently transitioning from SMC to UCLA and will begin in the fall as a junior. We are both a part of the Alpha Omega campus ministry here in the West Side. For those of you who may be joining us today for the first or the second time, we'd like to thank you for joining our family. If you enjoy today's sermon, please look at our website for more updates and more lessons. Today we're having a campus-led service, which means the entire service will be run by students who attend Pepperdine, UCLA, or SMC and are all a part of the AO Westside campus ministry. But before we begin this special service, I think that it would be good to take some time to stop, breathe, and process all that has been going on the last couple of weeks. The racial injustice and heightened emotional state of our country has impacted both of us not only because we identify as Black, but because we're both daughters of Black men. The times of raw reflection that I've been able to have with my dad have led me to have a deeper respect for him. His ability to be a loving, empathetic, faith-filled, and spirit-led father in spite of all the things the world has thrown in his direction has given me a clear example of how to live righteously and wholeheartedly for Christ in all areas. The current state of our society has also allowed my respect for my father to grow, but it has also forced me to rely on God for my father's protection. I, alongside many other African Americans, have to struggle with a paralyzing fear of potentially losing our father to a racist individual or a scared policeman. Knowing our justice system will do little to protect my father, and my inability to do so as a Black woman, I have to rely on God and truly trust in Him for the safety of my father. But it has also caused me to cherish my dad and not take any moment we spend together for granted and continuously appreciate all the amazing things he does for me, little or big. And as you guys are all aware of, the West Side Church has created a kingdom inclusion team, which is focusing on helping us handle the sin of racial injustice. Let us grow as a church in our understanding of biblical justice and create a society where young black children aren't fearful of losing their fathers. And let us cherish our fathers today. As we do so and continue to form a deeper connection with our earthly fathers as well as our heavenly father, the song that we will start service with is titled So Will I. It's a song that illustrates us worshiping God alongside all of his creation. Some of my favorite lines from the song come from the bridge and we sing, if the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. I hope you enjoy service and happy Father's Day. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. With no point of reference, he spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of Every paint 
painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. My name is Naomi Rasmussen, and I'm currently a senior at Pepperdine University getting my teaching credentials. And as hard as the transition to online has been, I am so grateful. I'm currently in Colorado, and with everything being online, it has allowed me to stay super connected to the family here in the West Side. And if this is your first or second or hundredth time watching, welcome to the family. We're so glad you're here. Now, today is a special service. Not only is it Father's Day, but it's also a campus-led service. Students from Pepperdine, UCLA, and Santa Monica College have worked really hard to bring you the sermon and the welcome and contribution and everything in between. So we really hope you guys enjoy. Now, as a future educator and just a college student, I love learning new things. It's one of my favorite things. And so me and a couple other college students thought today would be the perfect opportunity to learn some more about you, the dads, in the West Side. So we sent out a couple questions asking people different things about their dads. The first question that we asked was, what's your favorite picture of you and your dad? For me, this is my favorite picture. I had been living in Germany for the past year and my dad was coming out to visit me. I had just gotten off the bus at the train station and I could not have been more excited to see my dad. My dad and I have a really special relationship so it was amazing to be able to get to see him after such a long time away. Now, let's go see some other people's favorite pictures. Come on! Here's my favorite picture of my dad. Of all my photos with my dad, uh, this one is definitely my favorite. It is this Polaroid. I really like this one. I don't know why, I just like it. Hi, my name is Naomi and I'm a third year student at UCLA. I love seeing the pictures of you and your dads. The next question we asked is what is one word that describes your dad? One word that describes my dad is understanding. He's really good at understanding me and seeking to understand others. Let's see what some of our friends had to say. Come on! Okay, one word I, use, I would use to describe dad is probably quirky. Quirky is the one word to describe dad because he is quirky. Just like me. One word that I would use to describe my dad is brave. One word to describe my dad is provider. One word to describe my dad is intelligent. One word to describe my dad is probably resilient. My dad is hardworking. My dad is thoughtful. Um, my dad is funny. I'd say spectacular. Sacrificial. He, he's, he's, he, 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 like Iron Man. That's a good word. Uh, he's loving. If I could describe my dad in one word, it would be loving. Sacrifice. Hello there friends. My name is Daniel Lopez and I'm a sophomore at Pepperdine University. You know, the one thing that I love to think about when it comes to Father's Day is the way that I appreciate my dad. As for me, the one thing that I appreciate is that he makes it pretty easy to come to him with my mistakes. However, the majority of the time, it's because he's probably made that mistake before. Well, hey, that's why we both need grace, right? Let's go ahead and hear what our other friends have to say. One thing I appreciate in my dad is that um, he's always so just, in, like always has my back. Oh, he's always God. with me whenever I do something. And he always spend time with me and stuff. And he, and he do homework with me. One thing that I appreciate about my dad is that he's very giving and he always goes out of his way to help others. One thing I appreciate about my dad is that he's very sacrificial and always puts us first. Uh, one thing I really appreciate about my dad is how much uh, he cares for a bunch of different people, not just my family and I, but for a lot of other people, whether it's church or um, just random people. Um, what I appreciate about my dad is just how he's willing to do all the hard work that's not necessarily recognized uh, by other people. I appreciate my daddy because he's nice to me. One thing I appreciate about my dad is that he gets me food. One thing I appreciate about my dad is that he's always so kind and loving to me. 
One thing I appreciate about my dad is that he's willing to play with me a lot, even when he's injured. I appreciate how he never lets me forget how much I'm loved. I appreciate how loving and caring my dad is. I appreciate how my dad helps me when I need it. I appreciate that he teaches me a lot of things. Hey everyone, my name is Brandon Wong and I'll be a junior at Pepperdine University in the fall. As much as I love school and I'm super grateful for my education, there's nothing and no one that has taught me more than my dad. Um, and I think the greatest lesson that I've learned from him is just that God loves me for exactly who I am. The good, the bad, and everything in between. Let's see what our friends have learned from their dads. Come on. One thing I've learned from my dad is to never give up. One thing I learned from my dad is making a mask on a sewing machine. One thing I learned from my dad is to always finish what you start, whether it be with food or work. One thing I learned from my daddy is how to paint pictures. Um, one thing I've learned from my dad is just how to be a servant and how to always be ready and willing to serve other people uh, before myself. One thing I learned from my dad is how to shave. Patience. I've learned a lot of patience from my dad. Being grateful and being, and being grateful to our parents and friends. Probably just how to work really hard, but also do so with, um, with care and compassion for others. I would say one of the more impactful things he's taught me is how to love people. One thing that my dad has taught me is to never back down from a challenge. Okay, the one thing I learned from my dad is that it's always better to give than receive. I mean, it's just like a better feeling to give. I don't know why. Just a feeling in my heart. <laughs> Thank you so much to all our friends for helping us get to know your dads. I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon. But in the meantime, stay tuned for the rest of our Father's Day service, as we remember not only our earthly dads, but our heavenly one as well. Happy Father's Day. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm a Pepperdine student, as you can see by the hat. I'm going to be a junior and I'm a religion major, and today I'm going to be praying for our offering. You guys have been so faithful with giving, even through this tumultuous time, and um, just on behalf of the church, I just want to say thank you. Um, it just shows to your te as a testament to your love for the church and um, as your faith in general. Um, and this month has been our special missions offering. Um, this All of the money from this offering goes to help our churches in the Middle East, in Mexico, in Central America, and in the Nordic and Baltic areas of Europe. Um, we are about two-thirds of the way to our goal of $100,000. We're at $66,400, and let's just finish this race. Let's keep going and um, give them all of their needs and just show all of, their, um, all of our love for, those, uh, for our ministries in those countries. Um, and you can see how you can tie through the uh, Tithely app or through the um, church's website, or um, or by text. Um, you'll see a slide next to me. <laughs> and uh, I also want to just discuss a teaching that Jesus brought up in the book of Matthew. It's Matthew 5, 23 through 24. He reads, So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come offer your gift. And I just want to encourage you this morning by repeating <laughs> exactly what Jesus said. <laughs> um, be reconciled to your brother or sister before you give your gift. Be reconciled to your brother or sister before you give your gift. I realize that your relationships can be complicated. It might not be that easy to be reconciled to your brother or sister, but you have to ask yourself, are you trying? As Christ followers, we're called to forgive radically. Jesus says, forgive or you shall not be forgiven. And that's pretty scary. If we're not being, if we're not forgiving, we may not even be forgiven. And, um, you know, I think that, um, this passage really just shows Jesus is making a point, you know, do the important parts of the law first, which is, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. 
you know, the extra stuff, the giving, the sac- like the sacrifices back in the Old Testament, all that extra stuff. God, God didn't want any of it if they hadn't repented and they didn't love him or if you weren't loving your neighbor. Um, so as we continually are giving our gifts and offerings to God every week through our finances, let us also make sure to continually forgive and reconcile with our brother and sister throughout our weeks, ultimately contributing to the unity and um, the body of Christ that we are a part of as a pleasing gift to God. So I'll pray for our offering. Dear God, thank you so much for um, giving us this just beautiful church that we get to be a part of. What a blessing it is to be able to meet all of these people. Um, I'm thankful for their faithfulness in giving, and I pray that you um, keep inspiring us to give through our finances, but also by loving our neighbor. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, what's up, family, and everyone else tuning in on YouTube to watch. Uh, my name is Josh Vasquez, and I am a, a senior at Pepperdine University uh, studying physics, and I am so honored <clears throat> and just um, to have the privilege of giving the Father's Day lesson. Um, and before I get into the lesson, I've got to acknowledge all the dads, all the father figures, uh, all the moms who step into the role of a father, um, for all the amazing um, love and sacrifice that you've given us, um, even though we didn't really do anything to merit it um, or to deserve it. Um, I know that for me, today means so much because I can think back on how much my dad has done for me and how much he continues to do for me. And a memory that I, I came to mind as I was writing this was uh, back in middle school, you know, pretty much day in and day out, my dad uh, would pick me up and on the ride home, he'd say things like, this is how my day would work with, blah, blah, blah. And he says, Josh, I want you to know that I want you to be better than I am. The reason I work so hard is because I want to give you everything you need to be equipped to go and be better than me, to go and do better than me. And that's amazing. But that's the heart of my dad. Um, and so I just take this day to thank him and to love him and to show my appreciation for him and his hard work. Um, and so before I get into the sermon, I just want to open us up in prayer. Uh, dear God, thank you so much, Lord, for this day, uh, for the ability and the opportunity you've given me um, to give the Father's Day lesson, Lord. I pray that um, you would speak through me, uh, speak through your scripture, God, and, and just the illustrations that I have, Lord. Um, I pray that this would really convict people and help people want to know you better as a father. Um, and that they would want to know you deeper and that they would want to share you um, and to just help other people get to know you, Father. Um, so I love you, Lord. Thank you for all of the dads out there, all the father figures and everyone else, Lord. And I pray that, God, that you would comfort those who have lost a father today. Um, that you would comfort those who um, never grew up with a father, God. And, and I, I pray that they would know and that my lesson would help them understand that God is their father. God is all of our fathers, and there's no love, no human love, that could ever be as great as God's. Um, so I thank you, Lord, for giving us that gift, um, and it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. So the title of my lesson is God the Father, um, but before I even get to that idea of God being the Father, I wanted to talk about how we even uh, came to be in that position as children of God or as, as uh, being able to call God Father. And so my first point is that we are adopted children of God. Um, and so let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Ephesians 1, uh, verses 3 through 5. And it reads, Blessed be the God and the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, been, uh, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. So before I even dive into the scripture and talk about it more, I, I wanted to um, talk about Paul, but not the Apostle Paul. I want to talk about one of my best friends, Paul, Paul Dorsen. Paul, if you're watching this, bro, I love you so much. Uh, Jim, I love you so much. Um, and yeah. So the reason I bring up Paul is because Paul is adopted. He was adopted by Jim and Mary, as you see in these pictures. Um, and I wanted to talk about Paul and his family because I think that there are a lot of parallels between earthly adoption and, and this idea of heavenly adoption. Um, so the first one that comes to mind is just how hard earthly adoption is. You know, if you are an adopted parent, then you understand that there are uh, legal and financial paperwork that has to be sorted out and, and done. And there's this long process that you have to go through to even adopt your kid, right? Um, and not even that, but there are so many social interactions and encounters that you have time after time, questions that you get tired of. Um, one of them that I'd imagine 
on the Jim and Mary God would be like, oh, so I see you have Paul, but do you have any children of your own? Uh, and and Jim is a, is a very funny and sarcastic guy, so I'd imagine his response to that question would be, especially after a while of getting it, would be, oh, oh, yeah, come in, I have, I have something to tell you. Paul is ours. Crazy. Or, or the question like, oh, uh, I know that you, know, you guys adopted Paul. Uh, are you guys raising him to know his culture, to understand his culture? And Jim, once again, will probably say, let me think. Well, yeah, Paul loves the NBA. Uh, we read Cat in the Hat before um, he goes to sleep every night. He loves pizza and he loves hamburgers. And so, yeah, he even loves SpongeBob. You know, so he is being raised in his culture. Um, and it is, it is really um, a great thing or a great question that you asked that. Um, so here's, here's my point is that, you know, once Jim and Mary chose to adopt Paul, Paul became their son. Paul became a part of their family and a part of their culture because he really was their son. Um, and the second parallel that I draw is that um, the emotion and love in an adoptive family is just as real as that of a real family. It's just as strong. Um, and the one memory that I have of, of just being so uh, representative of this is when Paul lost his mom, Mary, in 2016. Um, I remember this day vividly uh, because we, we had gone to uh, play uh, our rivals in soccer and Paul's our goalkeeper. But halfway through the game, Paul leaves. Jim, his dad, leaves. Uh, they leave because they're, they're, uh, because Mary was um, in, in, in surgery, but, but the surgery had gone wrong. And I remember going back home and hugging my mom because I had heard the news. At first we were confused. Why did Paul leave? What happened? At the end of the game, we got no, we got news that it was because his mom was was having a really tough time and she might not make it. And so I went home, I hugged my mom, and I was so grateful for my mom. And the next day at school, I remember Paul walked up to me, you know, just as we did every morning, uh, and, and he dapped me up. But this this time he was he was staring at the ground and he was sad. Um, and I was so scared. I was like, how do I even word this? What do I even say? And so I just asked, did it happen? He shook his head. And my heart broke. And I could tell that Paul was fighting back tears all day. Um, and so my point in this is that Paul never really questioned whether his, you know, whether Mary was uh, his adopted mother. He just knew Mary was his mom. That's all he knew when she when she adopted him. When him and, when Mary and Jim adopted Paul, he became part of their family. And in the very same way, when when God adopted us, we became a part of His family. You know, we posed so much hardship for God before we were His children. Before we decided to declare Jesus as Lord, to turn away from our sin, to turn away from ourselves, we were a handful. And even after we decided to do that, we were a handful. We still are. And we heard him day after day. But also the emotion that is in our relationship with God is, is, is so incredibly strong. The emotions that God has for you are so strong. And so this love should be what compels us into a deeper relationship with God and into a missional life. Right. We should want other people to know who our father is. And we should want our father even deeper. And so right now, I have the privilege of um, introducing Maria, who is going to uh, give us and, and just share with us how she's seen God as being her heavenly father throughout her life and how much that means to her. Hi Westside family, my name is Maria Chavez. I'm a rising junior at Pepperdine University and I'm super excited to be sharing with y'all today on this very special day. I do wanna be honest with you all in saying that this holiday in particular has brought up a lot of emotions throughout the past 19 years of my life because of the fact that I grew up without having my biological father in my life. Over the years growing up, this holiday was very hard because I remember going to school and having our teachers give me a card to write down a thank you and I love you letter to my father. 
but I would have a hard time addressing it to one specific person. Now, I do want to say that I've been beyond blessed to have incredible spiritual father figures in my life, and I'm so thankful that my older brother took that responsibility onto himself and has been such an amazing father figure in my life. So I love you, and I thank you, big brother. But growing up and not having my biological father in my life has brought a lot of difficulties and a lot of insecurities. And so growing up and learning to deal um, and cope with this special holiday, I started a tradition when I was younger to write a, an I love you, a thank you, a happy Father's Day card to my Heavenly Father. And as I was writing the card for this year, I couldn't help but to think about the verse in Psalm 91 too that says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And at that moment, a rush of memories just came upon me as I was able to think and look back at all the incredible ways that my Heavenly Father has been there for me and my family. Like one, supporting my pursuit of a higher education by providing the incredible opportunity to go to Pepperdine University. Or even the fact that Every single day that I make a mistake, he always picks me back up. But most of all, for the fact that he saved me, that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross, a criminal's death, so that I can have the gift of life and experience a greater purpose for my life. So even though I grew up not having my biological father around, I still turned out okay. My life still turned out okay because of my Heavenly Father who was working behind the scenes to reveal His perfect plan in my life. All those areas that were left with holes in them the day that my biological father walked out of my life were immediately filled the moment that I committed my life to Christ and was adopted into His family. All of those difficulties that the world has brought my mother and I have been lifted off of our shoulders, not because of anything that we did or did deserve honestly but because my heavenly father loves me that much and he loves us that much so to those earthly fathers i want to say thank you for what you do thank you for the ways that you are there and that you love your wife your children your family both blood and spiritually and i want to encourage you all by continuing to follow his example in John 15, Jesus talks about the vine and the branches. And in verse 4 specifically, he says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. In abiding in him, in imitating him, not only will you inspire, but you'll lead your family and others around you into a journey with Christ. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for sharing that and just sharing your heart with us. Um, yeah, that's really incredible. How God really fills us in, in the parts of our lives that we feel like we don't, that that are missing, that we don't have, um, that we can't fix. God's there and He fills those gaps. Um, praise God. And my next point um, is that God is our Father. And I wanted to share with you guys something that really resonated with me and convicted me about this idea of of God being our Father, and how that's it's so central, that, that idea is so central to Christianity and to my life. So let me read it. It's, it's by Janet Hacker in his book called Knowing God, and it reads, What is a Christian? The question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that a Christian is one who has God as Father. If you want to know, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of being God's child and having God as his Father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he doesn't understand Christianity very well at all. That's a very bold last statement. But when I read that for the first time, it struck me. Whoa, I call God Father all the time. I pray God, or I pray Father God, whatever, right? But I don't really internalize, I don't understand I don't even take the time to understand what that means, what, what it means for me to call God Father. And we call God, or God gets called a bunch of different names, and he's referred to in different names throughout the Old Testament, um, such as Lord, 
Yahweh, Jehovah, um, Adonai, El Shaddai, Elohim, right? All these names are used to refer to different characteristics of God. Um, but how many times is he referred to as Father in the Old Testament? Well, as we can see here, God is referred to as Father in the Old Testament only 15 times. And when compared to the Gospels, it is nothing. Jesus really referred to God as Father exclusively. Jesus, to Jesus, God was his Father. And what's amazing is that he wanted us to understand that as deeply as he understood it. And he wanted us to know God just as he knew God. And so I want us to turn to one, uh, one, one uh, situation where Jesus actually calls us to know God as Father. Um, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew 6, verses 6 and verse 9. And they read, But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Pray in this way. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Wow. Guys, this is the first time in all of Scripture that we are encouraged to call God Father, to pray to God as Father. The very first time, you look throughout the entire Old Testament, not once are we encouraged to pray to God Father. That's, a, that's incredible. Do you know how intimate the word Father is? That word is only designated, it's only meant for one person. You don't go around calling people father, right? You call your dad father. That's the only person it's really intended to be meant for. And Jesus is telling us, father, he's your father. He's my father. And if we were to step into this situation, this is a sermon on mine. If we were, if we were to step into this and just look around at people's um, facial expressions and, and their reactions towards what Jesus just said, not to mention everything else he says in this sermon, but for this one specific point, is uh, I'd imagine people were like, did he just say that? Did he just tell us to, to pray to God as Father? I'm sure some people were shocked, confused, some infuriated. And actually, some people were infuriated. Um, let's turn to John 5, um, verse 18. In some context before this scripture, um, Jesus uh, walks up to a man, a lame man, he can't walk. He hasn't been able to walk for 38 years, and he, um, he tells him, get up and walk and take up your bed. And the Jews who were around that witnessed it, and they saw that Jesus was referring to God as Father. And let's, read the, let's read about their reaction. So it says, for this is the reason the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father, thereby making himself equal to God. Wow. Think about that. Think about the very first part of that. For this is the reason, this is the driving motive for why the Jews, the Pharisees, wanted to kill him, to kill Jesus. Because he was calling God Father. You know, they must have just been like, who the heck does this guy think that he is calling God Father? Calling God Father. They, to them, he was minimizing everything God was. And he was very, it seemed to them, very prideful of him to do that. And not only that, he, it must have been like, he's going to lead so many people astray. If he starts calling God Father, well, then why doesn't everyone start calling God Father? Wouldn't you want to be the son of the creator of the universe, of God, of the God of the Old Testament? They were infuriated to the point where they wanted to kill Jesus. And guess what? They did. But here's the kicker, is that Jesus wasn't leading anyone as creator. In fact, Jesus was, Jesus was leading us to God. He was helping us understand that if we know God as a father, everything is opened up. Our eyes are opened up. We see, we understand, we feel God deeper. We no longer want to sin because it's going to hurt my father. I don't care that I have to deprive myself and deny myself and carry my cross because you know what? My, my dad loves me so much that I don't even want to hurt him. He helps us understand how much God loves us. That's why he wants us to call him father. 
And that's so radical. That's so radical. Just think about that. Calling God Father. So this, guys, this is the love. This is, this is why we should want to be compelled into a deeper relationship with our Father, to know Him deeper, and to let other people know the gospel, to have this mission of life where they also get to know Father as their Father as well. My last point is that this is supposed to drive us into a relationship and mission, but why? Well, here are a couple of pictures of my dad and I, and, and the reason I, I want to talk about this is because I want to show you guys the emotion that I have for my dad, and hopefully that can help us understand the emotion we should have for God. So in these pictures, you can see that I am just, I'm, I'm in love with my dad. You know, I am so joyful, I'm um, feeling protected and, and cared for and secure in my dad, and um, man, I never want to leave his side. Um, and, you know, there are so many times where um, I would just fall asleep on my dad's, like, shoulder, chest area. Um, I, I'd lay my head right here, my neck would go here, and I would just, just fall asleep there. And there was no place more secure than that one. There was no place I felt more loved and more encouraged to be, um, to be myself and just to, to love him so much. Um, and not only that, but sometimes I would lay my head on his, on his, on his heart or on his stomach even, I'd like lay my ear there and just listen. It was kind of weird, right? But it was intimate. It was intimate in every sense of the word. And the reason I think God wants us to have a childlike faith is because otherwise we're going to be hindered by, um, you know, what's socially acceptable, right? We're going to be hindered. We're going to hinder our intimacy with God. And he wants us to be really intimate with him. That's the, that's the very first thing he wants us to do is to be intimate with him and, and to understand he loves us and to spend time with him. Just that being the very motive of our quiet times, just to spend time with God, to get to know him better because he loves us and cares for us so deeply. And the last scripture I want to share is, is in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39, which really, do, which really does show um, the heart for God, the heart that God has for us. Um, and so it reads, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I'm going to give a quick example of how I've hurt my dad. Um, it's not the, the biggest example, but it is the most recent. Um, after coming back from Pepperdine and um, being stuck in quarantine, I wanted to, to FaceTime my friends and to call them and to see how they were doing. Uh, I wanted to do it so often, but the issue was that I was prioritizing this over helping my dad work. Um, and, and it got to a point where um, for about a week, for like five days or so, um, he would ask me if I, would, if I were able to help him. And I'd say, no, I actually have something scheduled. I'm so sorry. Um, and I would really truly feel bad, but what am I supposed to do? Reschedule? The answer is yes, but I wasn't doing that. I was prioritizing myself. And they got to a point where one day he asks me, hey, hey Josh, uh, come down here. I need your help. And I was like, I can't. I, I told someone that I called him in 15 minutes. And I remember um, he, he just was so disappointed. He said, all right, then just, just leave. Do whatever you want to do. I don't care. And that hurt, guys. You better believe that that hurt. I remember that during that whole call, I wasn't even paying attention, really. Uh, forgive me if that was you, but I honestly wasn't paying attention. I was so in my head about how I hurt my dad. But the amazing thing is, is that he doesn't hold that over my head, you know? And I've done my, I've completely changed. I shouldn't say completely changed, but I'm doing so much better. And I've cleared up time for my dad because I don't want to disappoint him like that again. I don't want to hurt him like that again because I love him and because he loves me so much. And guys, that's the exact heart that God has for you and for me and for everyone. There's nothing that can ever separate you from his love. So, guys, that's the reason we should want to have a deeper relationship. That should compel us to a deeper relationship and to a missional life. And a final call to everyone 
who's in a leadership position, acknowledge it, understand that you're in a leadership position, whether you're a father or a father figure, or just, you know that people look up to you. And if you don't know people look up to you, well, you know, chances are people probably look up to you. Um, but be conscious of what you're doing and understand that you need to lead as Christ was led by God. Christ looked up to God and he said, I'm going to do whatever you do. In the same way we should look to Christ so that everyone who looks to us is going to have a Christ-like example. We're not going to be perfect, but we can be as best we can with this. Um, because otherwise, guys, someone or something else is going to lead your kid. If it's not you, something else will. And knowing the culture today, it's not going to be something that leads them down the best of paths. And so I want to call us all to be more, more conscious of our positions of leadership. Um, and this is, this is biblical. Let me just read this scripture in John 5, verse 19. It says, Jesus said to them very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing on his own, but only when he sees the father do him. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. So thank you guys for listening to my lesson today. Fathers, thank you for everything you do. Um, and thank you, God, for everything you do. Good morning, Westside. My name is Kendall Horn, and I'm a part of the Pepperdine Campus Ministry. I'll be headed into my senior year at Pepperdine this upcoming semester. This morning, before we partake in communion, I really just wanted to reflect and talk about two of the reasons that I'm very thankful for fathers, for father figures, and you know, ultimately for our Heavenly Father on, on Father's Day. The first of these reasons... Uh, is the comfort, the security uh, that a fatherly presence brings. Uh, almost like a warm, fuzzy blanket. You know, fathers just have this incredible ability to just um, make everything feel all right. They just, whether it's their presence or even just the thought of them in a lot of cases, um, they're just able to bring this peace of mind and uh, peace to our hearts when, when we're going through tough times or when we're struggling. And Really, I think this is just an outgrowth of the incredible love that fathers show to their sons and daughters. And obviously, um, we see the best example of this uh, from God, um, you know, loving us, sending uh, his son down on the cross for us. The second uh, reason that I really want to talk about today for just my thankfulness for fathers is just their ability to see our full potential. You know, it's so easy uh, when we get down or when we make a mistake. Um, for us to just stop believing in ourselves. But fathers, you know, through that love they have for us, they're able to see our, our potential even when, even when we don't believe in ourselves. And I know I've experienced this self. I know I've experienced this myself with my own father. Uh, growing up, I played hockey. And, you know, for a long time, my dad coached me, coached a lot of my teams. And there was, I remember one game very specifically. We're near the end of the game. It's a tie game. And there's just a few minutes left. And I basically tip a puck in on my own net. I, I score on my own team. And so now, you know, we're down just a few, with just a few minutes left, we're down a goal. And I skate back to the bench after it happens. And my dad looks at me and he's like, Kendall, he's like, it's all right. Like, you're going to get it back. And, you know, my angry, frustrated little seven-year-old self like turns to him. And I'm like, no, like, it's not okay. And like, <laughs> like, we're not going to get it back. And, you know, the very next shift, I go out on the ice and, you know, I score two goals and we, and we win the game. Uh, my dad was right, right? He he saw my full potential. He saw my ability to come through in that moment, even when I didn't think I could. And in that same way, the Lord sees our full potential. He's always seen our full potential. And when we embrace him, when we come to him, um, he's seen our full potential of what we can do um, in a relationship with him. And I think a verse that demonstrates this really well or succinctly this idea um, is Romans 5 8 but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us and this is a really powerful verse uh, even when we were stuck in our own sin even when we were still living in these evil ways God saw what we could be in him and he sent Christ his only his only son his perfect son to atone for our mistakes, to atone for our sin. 
Um, and so today, uh, you know, as we take communion, I just encourage you guys to think, think about, think about that. Think about the sacrifice Jesus made. Think about um, how we're able to achieve our full potential uh, with in our relationship with God as a result of that. Um, and now, um, Megan's going to share a few thoughts before uh, before we take communion. So, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Megan. I'm a sophomore at SMC and I really just wanted to thank Kendall for his sharing. His story totally reminded me of the characteristics of God. Um, super grateful that our father is a dad that is so gracious and even when we're caught up in anger or we're upset that we didn't perform the way we wanted to or we mess up or we're in sin or whatever it is, God's just there on our team and he's saying, we still got this <laughs> and I'll give you another shot. You're good. Um, a scripture that really reminds me of that is Psalm 18 verses 6 and 16 through 17. It says, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Verse 16 says, he reached down from on high and took a hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. And I think the reason that this psalm is so powerful to me is because God used his place of like being at a higher standing, not being in the mess, not being like in the, in the situation. He used that position to help. And he didn't have to, like he was doing his thing. And I think a lot of people struggle to think like, oh, like does God intervene in my life? You know, whether we have dads that are pretty absent or they weren't there for us when we needed him, you know, and that can be really hurtful. And it's really hard to not see that God is silent when we're in pain or when we're hurting. But I love that God intervenes even though he didn't even have to. And he came from on high to rescue me, to rescue you. And he could see the whole picture. And he was in the position to help because of the authority that he had over all the earth. And I think one of the biggest aspects of being a father, um, in my personal opinion, is that you're kind of like a new figure of, of authority to some people. You have some like little mini yous running around. And I think as Americans, at least I can struggle with the idea of authority because for some of us, it can feel like, oh, like, yeah, I feel represented and protected by authority. And other people feel like they're oppressive and harmful. And we're afraid because we're afraid they'll abuse their power or they'll invalidate us or they'll use their authority for selfish gain. Um, they could be all consumed by their own desires and not really care what you think or want. Um, they could be tyrannical or unloving or like the list could literally go on. But I love God because he doesn't use his authority in that way. God made the heavens and the earth and yet he allowed himself to be crucified by his own creation. Like, imagine that. Like, I don't know of any authority figures in my life that could or would have the capacity to do that. And that is who God and Jesus are. And that's what righteous authority is, coming from a higher place and using it to help others. And just like a lot of other things Jesus did, he turned upside down the notion of what authority even means. By Jesus' definition, I think authority would probably mean that he's in the all-knowing and secure position to give his life for other people. Even when he was on the cross, he did this. While people were ridiculing him, while he was literally being murdered, he was on the cross and he used his perfect standing with God to advocate on our behalf, to rescue us. He's there and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And that's just crazy. Like while we are literally... He's he's in this ultimate position of harm. Like he's just, I mean, he's obviously dying, you know. Um, and he uses his standing with God to help us when we're not helping him. Like I just think that, that is so amazing. And I don't know where you guys are all at this morning. I know Father's Day can be kind of a touchy subject for some people. Um, some of us have had amazing fathers who materialize this idea pretty well. 
And then there's others of us where our dad did more harm than good, or our dads abused their power over us, or some didn't come to rescue us when we needed him. And others have maybe even recently lost their dads, or their dads are absent and always have been. And wherever you're at, I just want you to know that you have the biggest advocate, someone that can and will move the heavens to save you, someone that would put themselves in harm's way to protect you and give you another shot. And that's our dad. And I'm so grateful. And thank you guys for letting me share. Andres is going to pray for us now. Please bow your heads with me as we pray for communion. God, we come to you in prayer. So grateful for the fact that today's Father's Day. And so grateful for the fact that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you for this sacrifice that allows for us to call you our father and that allows for us to have a direct relationship with you. I pray that we can take time to meditate and reflect on the significance of this sacrifice and the importance of our relationship with you and to not take it for granted. Thank you for this amazing day and I pray that you bless the rest of the service. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hello, Westside family. My name is Kenny Zuchuku, and I'm the Alpha Omega Westside Campus Minister. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special service as we have the campus students share their hearts. I am so grateful that they were able to give their time and energy into making this service excellent. So let's give a round of applause in your homes and your living rooms, and let's make sure that we don't forget them as we celebrate this Father's Day. I'm really looking forward to having all the students back in the fall, and uh, I'm really excited that they got this chance once again. Please be praying for our selection committee. I, I know many of you guys have been tuning in for our midweek gatherings, and many of you know that the Kingdom Inclusion team has been working their tails off to be able to bring content that addresses the racial injustice in our society. So we're going to continue to have this conversation during our midweek gatherings. If you're, if you're new or is the first time seeing this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and we will be able to send you more information through our social media and email. We're so grateful that you're able to tune in with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for having a great service. Please stay connected with us and remember to have an amazing Father's Day.